Hello, I'm Courtney Holland. Welcome to Save Our Towns, a series designed to guide and inspire those who are working hard in Appalachia to build strong communities. The episodes created by Outreach and International Affairs of Virginia Tech aim to celebrate what is great about small towns and also connect you with experts, resources, and more. In this episode, you'll learn why history is the elephant in the room in Irwin, Tennessee. Small Town Big Number reveals Virginia counties identified in the most recent economic distress report from the Appalachian Regional Commission. Then it's a visit to the Salt Trail in Glade Spring, the town we're following for a year. Your expert tip warns against undervaluing a community's artists. And in a bonus segment, we take you behind the scenes to the Governor's Summit on Rural Prosperity held in September at Virginia Tech. As always, we close with three questions for our mayor. First, your example of awesome story. Economic times may be tough for small towns, but a can-do spirit can work wonders, even in a town with a dark event in its past. Andrea Brunet reports. Irwin, Tennessee faced a severe economic jolt in 2015. The sudden closing of the CSX rail yard put hundreds out of work. Irwin also had a long-standing PR problem. A terrible event had put the town on the map a century earlier. Mary the Elephant was hanged here after she killed a circus trainer who may have abused her with a metal hook, and the hundred-year anniversary of that event was coming up, signaling an onslaught of negative publicity. It was right here that Big Mary was executed. She'd killed the man in nearby Kingsport, but Irwin had a big rail yard and a crane strong enough to hang an elephant. 5,000 people came to watch. The event cast such a big shadow on the town that some old-timers argued it shouldn't be talked about. Things finally changed, as the Appalachian Regional Commission's Catherine Fierick explains. They don't see it as a, a positive in their past, but they found a way to kind of spin it towards the future in a positive direction. That's due to the efforts of Jamie Rice, now Irwin's communications specialist, whose office in town hall looks out on the place where Mary was killed. Before 2015, Rice was commuting an hour to work in Asheville. Then a hundred-year-old deteriorating downtown building caught her eye and she and a friend launched a wedding venue business. We opened our doors the first week of October and by the third week of October we had found out that CSX was closing up their um, location here in Irwin and um, 300 jobs and our identity as a railroad town went right down the railroad tracks with them. And so my business partner, Kristen and I, we just looked at each other and shook our heads and we were just like, oh my gosh, this is not the best time to be opening a business in downtown Irwin, but we are going to persevere and we're gonna do everything we can um, to make sure that our town doesn't dry up and blow away. The town, including Rice and her newly formed group of young entrepreneurs called Rise Irwin, braced for the 100-year anniversary of Mary's death. Rice came up with an idea, the Irwin Elephant Revival, an event-filled celebration. Each year, artists paint statues made of fiberglass or concrete. The herd, as it's called, is placed downtown, a tourist draw until each October the statues are sold in an open auction. For a hundred years, we've had visitors come into town and they will have heard rumors about the story of Mary. And they would ask our merchants downtown and locals, you know, is this really true? Did this really happen? And for a long time, we all just hung our head and it's like we had a black eye over it. And we just said, yes, it's awful, it's terrible. But now we have created this positive um, energy behind Mary and all of our downtown merchants now can smile and give them the full um, elephant revival story about how we love elephants. Since the first revival in 2016, the auction has raised $20,000 for the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee. Town leaders were supportive from the start, offering connections and even money for the statue materials. And despite the rail yard closing, new loft apartments and retail shops have sprung up downtown, and new businesses include an outdoor supply company. A newly finished industrial site is being marketed to companies that might need access to rail. The town's proactive leadership helped Irwin avoid a common pitfall. 
And this is something that a lot of communities in our region suffer with, and that is pessimism and self-defeating every plan for success. When you have so many people telling you it'll never happen, it's bound to fail, we're going downhill, and you hear that day after day after day, then the people who have the ideas will not have the motivation to carry them out. Not so in Irwin, where, according to Firic, an overarching sense of optimism prevails. That and the ingenious move to donate money in Mary's memory to help take care of other exploited elephants. And they also took a notorious example from their past and they created something fabulous out of it. So this is a, a huge example of a community that really does it right. Numbers don't lie and our statistics show that we are in a much better position now than we were before the railroad closed and before the Irwin Elephant Revival started. Um, you know, we didn't want the railroad to close. We didn't want those jobs to go, but they happened. But now we can really see the benefits, the fruits of our labor of, of trying to, you know, get that heartbeat back into our downtown. If you'd like to bid on one of those elephant statues in next October's auction, look for details at the website irwintn.org. Coming up, some views about small town prosperity from the annual Governor's Summit. But first, in small town big number, Ann Brown gives a snapshot of some struggling counties in Virginia, along with three that are doing amazingly well. Appalachia is made up of 420 counties across 13 states. A new ranking places those counties in five economic tiers. The two bottom labels are at risk and distressed, making 10 our number today. That's how many Virginia counties show up at the bottom. The rankings are based on poverty levels, unemployment rates, and per capita market income. Distressed are Buchanan, Dickinson, Lee, and Wise counties. This puts them in the bottom 10% of all counties in the U.S. Slightly better off, but still at risk, are Grayson, Henry, Patrick, Russell, Scott, and Taswell. The FY 2020 report is one the Appalachian Regional Commission puts out each year, designed to help states and the commission map out grants and investments. Altogether, Virginia has 25 counties defined as within Appalachia. That means the stakes for investment decisions are high, given that 10 of the 25 are considered at risk or distressed. If you're looking for silver linings, poverty and unemployment rates drop slightly throughout Appalachia, and Virginia is home to three Appalachian counties, Bath, Botetourt, and Highland, in the top 25% of counties in the nation. But the key takeaway is for town leaders in distressed areas to know that they are supposed to be at the head of the line when they apply for and lobby for investments and grants. For more information, go to the Appalachian Regional Commission website, arc.gov, and from the menu items, click on Grants and Funding. Later, three questions for a mayor will take us back to Irwin, Tennessee to talk with Mayor Doris Hensley. But first, Diane Deffenbaugh offers a quick look at the long-standing project that Glade Springs leaders have been dreaming of but have never gotten off the ground. Outdoor recreation is a great asset for any town. Glade Spring has the Salt Trail, part of the National Rails to Trails program. Popular for walking, biking, and horseback riding, it runs more than eight miles from Saltville almost to Glade Spring. The trail stops about a mile outside of Town Square. Town leaders would like to see that change. We want to connect it to Town Square, but we're hoping maybe some connection to Emory Henry College. Earlier this year, the Community Design Assistance Center, part of Virginia Tech's College of Architecture and Urban Studies, reimagined this empty lot next to Town Square as a trailhead. CDAC, which gives students real-world experience, funded the work through a Virginia Department of Forestry grant. Designs call for vintage bricks reclaimed from the town's old train depot, along with signs, walkways, fencing, bike racks, and other amenities. But that design work is only the beginning. The community support um, for the salt trail is there, um, and I mean that trailhead design was phenomenal. I, it definitely gave us a lot of ideas and it, it definitely kind of um, got us thinking about it. Bringing the trail to Town Square has been on the town's agenda for years with previous efforts falling short. 
This time, the town first wants to determine if the project is also a priority for residents. But ultimately, it's, it's you know, the residents of, of Glade that get to decide um, what they think is, is important. Just as the project has been tripped up in the past, choosing a safe route and obtaining the required easements to cross private property may stall progress. Next, your expert tip. Jamie Bennett is executive director of Art Place America, a group that has given towns more than $100 million. He says it's a mistake for leaders to think about the town's artists only when a mural needs painting. In reality, artists have a set of knowledge, skills, and ability that are useful, especially in small town America, right? There are essentially two theories of economic development. You can either do something more efficiently or you can innovate. Artists are the only asset that is already present in every community of every size across this country. So if the asset is there, why not activate it as part of an overall community revitalization strategy? You can read a transcript of the complete interview at the Save Our Towns website where Bennett details towns where artists are part of the economic development. Click on the Connect with Experts tab. Now a reminder about Virginia Cooperative Extension. Extension agents and specialists live and work around the Commonwealth dedicated to subjects such as land management, community leadership, and youth development. On the Save Our Towns website, click on the Extension tab. There you can learn much more. You'll find Extension agents listed along with their areas of expertise and contact information. Next, a bonus segment from the Rural Prosperity Summit. You'll hear some surprising answers to two questions. First, what is the biggest obstacle to small town prosperity? I think the biggest obstacle is um, retaining and attracting current population, particularly younger people. I mean, myself being from Lynchburg, Virginia, semi-rural, once you leave the city limits, it's super rural, but everybody was talking about leaving town and nobody really wants to stay in a rural area as a youth. You know. I think the biggest obstacle is the workforce and workforce development and feeding the pipeline for our businesses. The lack of economic opportunities in those communities are just a, a drain. But it's not our goal to turn rural Virginia into urban Virginia. It's our goal to basically support the natural economies for rural Virginia. We're making better progress with it, but I think we need to really enhance broadband. Usually it's just sort of access, and that's access to information, it's access to resources. And economic developers tend to like to go for the big, big projects, and that's probably not realistic in all of rural Virginia. It's, you know, they should, tourism is great, I think, in rural Virginia because it's beautiful and um, so maybe a boutique hotel or a trail, whether it's a biking trail or a motorcycle trail or whatever people enjoy. I think those things make sense. I think, you know, encourage the little opportunities because they become big opportunities over, over time. From, from, from town to town, I, I guess one county wants to see the other county do it first because they, they don't want to be the first one to fail. It's access to capital. There is a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in our rural communities and a lot of great resources, but unfortunately there's a real shortage of capital in many of our areas. There's a challenge with the regulations that the lenders face um, with all of the paperwork they have to do. To be honest, for them to do a $300,000 loan takes the same amount of paperwork as a $10,000 loan. Question number two. What factor generates the most optimism? In the last century, we spent a lot of effort and investment in expanding electrical infrastructure to remote communities, the Rural Electrification Act. Uh, the same thing really is true for broadband. That is the lifeline that's going to be the electricity of the 21st century, is the, the lifeline of the 21st century. It allows people to be able to telework and do all kinds of things, do business with overseas partners, all from their 50-acre property in a very small community. Been at VDP 12 years, and I can see more recently there is a lot more collaboration between all the workforce partners, companies, economic development, higher ed. So that collaboration, I think, is going to bring lots of prosperity. I really do remember when it was all, the focus was on the big project, the big project, the big project. And now it's um, a much more diverse approach with different programs. Well, you, you have a lot of partnering agencies now that, that are on the same page. 
in, in, in years past, everybody was trying to do their own thing. We're seeing a resurgence in people wanting to go to small towns and small businesses and deal with people face to face. Well, I just think that everybody loves their small town and they want their small town to succeed. I think the whole argument of being a big fish in a small pond is also nice for a lot of folks, you know, where you stay in a small place like I have for as long as I, I know everyone there and it's a great thing. And I, I, I guess it's the people themselves. Uh, I really enjoy, but it's what Virginia is all about. That is why I've never left rural areas because the passion and the love that you have for the area where you come from, it's nothing like it. Next, for three questions, we head back to Irwin, Tennessee. Doris Hensley, Mayor, Town of Irwin. Homegrown. I think it's a very good thing when you talk about homegrown, we're all uh, closely knitted uh, family. It's just like we're uh, all families. We look after each other here. We, we take pride in who we are and what we do here. Housing. We are owned by state and federal governments. The majority of it, about 51%, is owned by the state and federal governments. So we're very limited in what developable land we have around here. So we are trying to come up with uh, some new ideas and be really um, kind of uh, experimental in what we can do to create more housing in Irwin. I just wanted to know what, that we're here, uh, that we have so many assets that we have really kept hidden for so many years. It's, Irwin has been kind of a, a secret uh, within our nation. We have the, the mountains, we have the rivers, we have the trails. Uh, if you love the outdoors, then this is the place to be. Would you like to nominate your town for an Examples of Awesome story? If so, we'd love to hear from you. To view past episodes and to dive deeper into resources and a wealth of information about small towns, go to the Save Our Towns website and please send your thoughts to saveourtowns at vt.edu. We read and respond to every email. This is episode four of season six. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.